Uh, having said that, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Dohler, Dr. Mission Dohler. He's uh, now leading the Intelligent Energy Group at the CTTC, which I'm not going to let him tell you what that is, in Barcelona, Spain, with focus on smart grids and green radios. He's working on machine-to-machine -machine and microgrids. He's a senior member of the IEEE and a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE Communications Society. Uh, he's fluent in six languages and is an experienced lecturer with more than 30 tutorials over the past decade. He's published around 150 technical journal and conference papers uh, at a citation H dash and G dash index of 28 and 60. You'll have to explain what that is. I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> Okay, and he holds a dozen patents. He's authored, uh, co-edited, and contributed to 19 books, has given 31 international short courses, and participated in various standardization activities. He's been a technical program chair member and co-chair of various conferences, such as technical chair of IEEE PIMRC 2008 held in Cannes, France. He's editor-in-chief of ETT, and, is, and is, has been holding various editorial positions for numerous IEEE and non-IEEE journals. Since 2009, he's also CTO of a company called World Sensing. From 2005 to 2008, he's been senior research expert at France Telecom in France. From 2003 to 5, he has been a lecturer at King's College London, UK. He obtained his Ph.D. in telecommunications from King's College London and also his diploma in electrical engineering from Dresden University of Technology, Germany in 2000 and his master's degree, science degree in telecommunications from King's College London, U.K. in 1999. So, uh, as a distinguished lecturer, it's our privilege to have him here today speaking. So. Dr. Dollar, all right, of course yours. You know, before the iPhone came along, <laughs> before the iPhone came along, the operators, the AT&Ts and the Verizons, they were really unhappy because they felt that, you know, the network is completely underutilized and they could do squeeze more out of this. They're looking for the big killer application. Now along came the iPhone, and again they're totally unhappy because the network is completely oversaturated. And one of the reasons that is happening is because we are using it the whole day, okay? Consistently, we start in the morning in the bed, uh, breakfast, we're going to work, uh, you know, before lunch, at lunch, after lunch, at work, uh, coffee, afternoon, evening, and back in bed. We're just using this smartphone all over the place and all the time. Uh, often with very high capacity stuff, and that is actually saturating the, uh, the network. So now the operators are, are back to being unhappy and uh, just to have uh, understand where we are using it, it turns out in about 80% of the cases we are actually indoors and about 20% in outdoors. Outdoors means we're commuting, we're traveling, we're shopping, something like that. It doesn't mean we have to forget the outdoors world, uh, it just means that you know, we're not using it that often, but you know, if we didn't have the ability to use a smartphone outdoors, we would be very unhappy. And this is what gives us, you know, the AT&Ts and the Verizons a very big headache because it's relatively easy to come indoors, but it's not so easy to come outdoors. Now today I happen to speak about the, the indoor case, and we're going to dwell on that. But so you just understand the numbers. Now in terms of uh, what it means in terms of capacity, um, <clears throat> it will just really increase pretty badly. So you know they're like predicting that in uh, by 2020 there will be 127 exabytes, 10 to the power 18. It's almost as many monocles we have in the universe, so many bytes will be exchanged essentially by 2020. We don't understand that these numbers are meaningless. Okay? The only thing I want you to understand is that as years drag on, you know, the, the increase in capacity over the wireless interface, the one you're using on your smartphones, on your iPads, etc., will increase exponentially. Now are we prepared for that? Are we prepared for that? It turns out very badly, and this slide explains it a little bit. Yes. Uh, um, in, in Europe and in Asia, they use their smartphones for a lot more, as much as you know, like buying a Coke to paying your rent. And I, 
how is their data usage so much less when their their networks are so much more uh, versatile than ours? Well, I, you know, the, the, the one which gives the operators a lot of headache is actually the uh, the video stuff, the heavy stuff. Okay. Now, Asia doesn't have Asia doesn't have Netflix. Okay. China doesn't have Netflix yet. Okay. So they use a lot of these smartphones, but it's not like heavy video thingy. Um, Europe, yes, we're using it. Okay. I use a lot for you know streaming stuff, etc. Um, you know, I presume in the U.S. A heavy traffic is really the Netflix kind of YouTube and all that. And uh, I, you know, I talk to AT and T guys, and they're just horrified about this. Okay, because they can't, you know, they just don't get along. And I'll tell you now why on this slide. The next slide, actually, you understand why we're not ready for that. So there's a standards body called IMT, which is a international kind of group of guys, uh, Swiss guys, okay, big valleys somewhere in, in Zurich, sitting there, uh, sitting there and standardizing essentially, you know, the telecom system. Now, in 1998, 99, uh, 2000s, they got together and they said, hey, let's put out the requirements for our next generation system, which would be the 4G system, okay? They got together and said, all right, so that system needs to be really power efficient and spectrally efficient, and they came up with some numbers like, uh, it has to have 2.2 bits per second per person. I'm not sure it means something to you. It doesn't mean anything to me, actually. It doesn't mean anything to anybody. Okay? But they have to have this type of uh, spectral efficiency. And um, when you start doing the, math, the maths on that, and you say, okay, with that spectral efficiency, and you have cells about 500 meters radius, so pretty small, okay? and you have a spectrum which is 40 megahertz, which is not too little, okay? it's quite some chunk. You figure out it supports 100 megabits per second per square kilometer. All right, that means a whole campus of your university, which is probably a square kilometer. I'm sorry, I didn't do it in square miles. I'm not sure how, many, how much of it is. But you can do the math. So uh, I presume that campus is about a square kilometer. You would have just 100 megabits per second uh, for the whole campus. Okay. Now let's do what we really need. We sat down. We figured out. The density of people is actually pretty high, even European cities. So in Europe, we go up to 5,000. Mumbai is uh, you know, 10,000. You got the uh, New York cities, the uh, um, uh, Mexico, etc. So the, the density, the peak density of people can reach up to 8,000 people per square kilometer. I presume at this university, you probably reach that number very, very easily. Now, if you go down and you say, okay, let's assume 10% of these 8,000 are subscribed to a broadband service like Netflix, and about 20% uh, using them, you need 5 megabits per second uh, to actually support the service. You end up with a capacity density of 800 megabits per second per square kilometer. Okay? So you understand that our visionary guys in 2000 said we need 100, 100 megabits per second per square kilometer. And we actually need 800 megabits per second. And this, was, this calculus was done before the iPhone actually came out. And we actually started using broadband much more. Probably by now, it's a factor 10 beyond that. So it's probably 10 gig per square kilometer. So the 4G requirements <clears throat> were showed by a factor of 10 yesterday, and short by a factor of 50 today. I will be short by a factor of 100 tomorrow. That's very bad. Okay, so the, the wireless community has done a really lousy job. Very lousy. You know, the computing co community, you never actually hear people talking about capacity limits. You know, it's just one of the applications, the Facebooks, the Netflix, etc. In the wireless community, we still have people talking about Shannon limit. You know, we're still talking about this limit. You know, what's the point? Design a system which really offers you a lot of capacity so we can focus on what we're supposed to focus on to write applications and get this economy going. And uh, incidentally, 4G is not even rolled out. So the Verizons and the at and they're cheating on you when they say they have a 4G system. It's not 4G, it's actually 3.9G or 4G minus epsilon. Probably they didn't want to call it, so they called it 4G. Okay. So the problem is when 4G really comes, I don't know what name they're going to put. They can't put 5G. So um, here you go. So just so you know about it, it's not a 4G system you're using. It will be out in a few time. Now, how have we been dealing as a, as a community in the past uh, about this increasing capacity, which has been increasing all the time? Turns out there's a chap out there called Martin Cooper, and he figured out that every 30 years, capacity doubles, uh, 30 months capacity doubles. Okay? So since the 70s, 80s, that means we had a million-fold increase 
uh, of the wireless capacity capabilities. Okay, so we had a 1G system, 2G system, until now the 3.9G system. So it's increased uh, in capacity by a factor of millions. Very impressive. Now, if we start looking, you know, who is responsible for this capacity increase? It turns out that making the cell smaller had the biggest impact by far. Factor 1,600. The spectrum had a factor of 25, so going from the GSM system, which had 120 kilohertz band, to now 5 megahertz UMDS, maybe 200 megahertz uh, LTA. You know that is essentially having an impact factor of 25 here. Physically, an impact factor of five. All right. Uh, that means um, that means you know we have been subsidizing a lot of physical layer research in the past to make our systems better, to come up with new modulation schemes, to uh, come up with new channel codes, and the impact is just completely negligible. Okay? Completely negligible. Maybe it would have been better off, actually, instead of uh, you know, paying all this research, actually uh, uh, just buy more small base stations, and probably by the year 90, 1990, we would have the capacity we have today. Okay, so it's very important to bear in mind the impact you have on the society. And if you look down on the cost, of course, making cells smaller, you need to buy property, you need to install, you need to maintain it, so it costs. It doesn't come for free. Spectrum doesn't come for free. It's free, actually, but the government leverage is on here, so it doesn't come for free. The whole research at all universities around the world of building a good physical layer system uh, has a cost. Now, what is important is if you do the ratio. So the important thing is the ratio between the gain and the, uh, the cost. Okay, and you see that making cells smaller is a good deal. Um, buying more spectrum is an okay deal. Working on the physical layer is a really lousy deal. Okay, so the impact is just very, very small. Now, whether you guys, I'm not sure whether you're physical layer guys, meaning those guys who design the modulation and coding scheme, you know, whenever you manage to get an improvement of 0.01 dB, I can tell you in the industry nobody cares about it. All right? Because just so you know, it's a nice research exercise, but uh, the impact in the real world is very low. So we have actually a nice paper out here, which is uh, called, Is the Physical Layer Dead? Now, with some authors, actually you may know some of them, Robert Hay from, uh, from, from Austin, uh, Ronaldo from uh, Bell Labs. Um, I was advocating the title, The Physical Layer is Dead! Exclamation mark, but they, are, they asked me to make it a question mark, so it would be a little bit more diplomatic, you know? So, uh, just to confirm that, we, as we grow in the uh, generations of wireless systems, so the, the IS-95 is U2G system, as we go from 2G to 2.5G, uh, 3G, 3.5G, 3.9G, 4G, you know, our improvement of link layer capacity is actually diminishing, okay? So as we dr drag along these generations, you know, as we go from 3G to 4G, we are not actually offering a capacity by a factor of 10, we're just offering an improvement by a factor of 2. Okay? And that's a big problem, because data rate goes exponential, and our capability on the on the point-to-point -point, uh, layer to su support actually these rates is, is actually decreasing exponentially. So we have a design problem here. Okay? Um, <clears throat> to do that, we really have to change how we design the system. Okay, and uh, really completely refocus, uh, redesigning the uh, four, four and a half, five G system, and uh, and yes, yeah, spectrum is not a problem, and powerfish is not a problem either. Okay, there's a lot of uh, research topics around here uh, being spectrally efficient. Spectrum is not really if you design it well, you know, with the chunk of spectrum we have today, 40 megahertz, uh, 80 megahertz, 100 megahertz, you can offer what we need to offer. So let me go on a few points. Of I, what I think will be very important uh, to, to actually start building the next generation system, so beyond 4G. We finished designing 4G and the standard part is the 4G system is called LTEA, meaning Long Term Evolution Advanced. Okay, it's a bit like LTE++. So it's a, a next generation, it's a 4G, so we're starting talking now about designing the 5G system. So one point we think is really important is to differentiate very, very clearly between wireless outdoor design, wireless indoor design. They will be very different, okay? So currently, the operators, the at and and the Verizons are trying to reach you everywhere. They're trying to reach you with the very same system, whether you're out as driving, whether you're shopping mall, whether you're at home uh, sitting in your living room. And uh, this has to change, 
And it has to change from an architecture point of view. We have to separate that design. So my talk will be today about the indoor talent. Okay, we'll talk about the femtocells and what is coming in. Then, you know, stop designing new physical layers, stop designing new access layers. You know, just take what is out there. They're really efficient. If you look at, you know, how good our technologies are today, they're very close to the limit. What it all only takes today is to put it all together. You know, you're building a team, a technology team. You're trying to assemble in a, in a good way the architecture and make it all work together. <coughs> Another thing, we have to acknowledge that the technologies without there are heterogeneous. So there is not a single technology out there which will do the job. We have cellular, we have Wi-Fi, okay? We have WiMAX. So there's a loads of different standards out there which are established, the infrastructure is out there. We're not just gonna take it out and build in a super system. No, the, the, the wires arena is very heterogeneous. You have a lot, load of different systems out there. Then stop talking about spectral efficiency. Spectral efficiencies mean, mean nothing to the people who use it actually. And they cheat us as engineers because we get away from the actual problem we have. You see, I, I, the whole 4G design has missed the point that we are actually short by a factor of 10 of the capacity needs because everybody was working on spectral efficiencies which have no meaning. Work on the absolute numbers so we know. Are we good? Are we close to the limit? Are we what we need? If not, start coming up with something new. And in addition, it's because we will be using different systems. We'll be using Wi-Fi at the same time as the cellular system. Uh, spectrum is very different. You know, Wi-Fi spectrum is for free. Cellular spectrum is uh, very expensive. So when you start putting all together, it doesn't make sense anymore to talk about a single spectral efficiency. You're just comparing apples and oranges. So work with the real numbers, with the with the numbers like bits per second per square kilometer. And then cost. You have to take cost into into consideration. It just happens that a lot of the design is done by engineers, and those these a lot of these engineers are not CFOs, they're not CEOs. They have no idea what it really costs to build out a system. And uh, you know, if you think a little bit, a lot of the cost issues are a question of the architecture. How do you assemble the computer? Okay, you can choose to put a lot of expensive components all over the place. You can make it cheap. You can actually let customers pay for the components. So there's a lot of juggling in terms of price, how to design the system, and nobody has really thought about this. And as we go from a voice-dominant era to a data-dominant era, things become very complicated for the AT&Ts and Verizon's because traffic goes up exponentially. You start using Netflix, YouTube, etc. Uh, but the revenue is flat. Okay. So uh, AT&T has runs its business today because of SMS, all right? Because that's the best deal. It's the best, you know, it's the best dollar per bit you send, all right? Whenever you use an SMS, it's the best thing they can do. So when you start using YouTube, you have typically like flat rates, at least in Europe, we have flat rates, so you just you know, download, you saturate the network, etc., etc. So it, it actually it actually flattens out the revenue. Now the problem is to support the traffic. The cost goes rather with the traffic than with the revenue. So it seems like you know the operators today pay quite a lot of money to subsidize actual companies like Google, Facebook, Netflix, etc. So we had a pretty unique deal in Spain. Um, it uh, Telefonica, which is our Verizon, there managed to convince Google to pay part of the infrastructure, which makes sense because it's you know people were using. Uh, Telefonica's infrastructure to uh, access services where somebody else was making money. So Telefonica said, okay, guys, either you pay up or we just close the pipe. So they struck a deal, and I think it's a pretty historic deal. I haven't seen that before and after, so we'll see how that plays out. So here you go. These are the five design criteria for future wireless systems. So the idea being like, you know, you are very flexible, you're free, you can walk around, you can take the train, the plane, etc. And can really, you know, concentrate on using the applications and services you want to do without looking for a cable. So what I'm going to do today, very high level really, I want to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about the, the fender cell design, okay, the indoor stuff, you know, how can we provision the data indoors. Not using Wi-Fi, but rather using a, a phantom cell, a cellular system. So I explain you what it is, and then a little bit on the on the actual management there, because it turns out we'll see that that as the number of phantom cells, you know, these little base stations you roll out increases, the number of degree of, uh, of the system decreases. That increases. So the problem is how to manage it. So the whole the whole system becomes a manager. The whole problem becomes a management problem. So we're going to talk only about these two things. Okay, phantom cells. Let's go for it. 
Vectorsol is a very small thing. It's like a Wi-Fi station. Okay. Um, I'll show you a picture in a moment. It's like a Wi-Fi station. The only difference is it's not Wi-Fi. It actually has a cellular interface. Okay. So it's a, a small base station you're actually installing at home. It's not the only way of offering a so-called small cell service. There are actually four ways of doing it. First one is a remote radio head. What is a remote radio head? Remote radio head is if you take a, a cable, a long RF cable, and you connect it essentially to your base station, but the antenna somewhere else. So there could be a base station on top of the roof, and they figured out this bad coverage in this room, so they put a long cable down here, put an antenna here, so we're all good. RF uh, remote head is, is, is a very stupid thing. has no intelligence whatsoever. Then comes the relay. Now the relay um, is, I'm not sure where this here it is. A relay is a kind of a station which helps a macro base station. So there might be a macro base station somewhere mounted out there. And we put a small relay station here. It is under the control of the macro, macro base station. Okay, It's just helping it to relay the data and you get a lot of uh, benefits, your power benefits, capacity benefits. Um, then comes a Pico base station. So that is literally a base <coughs> station, a small box administered by the operator, that's very important. So the operator realizes there's a problem somewhere on this campus in terms of capacity. My macro cell doesn't reach it. Uh, to put another macro cell base is just expensive, so what I do is I put a pico cell. Okay? The moment I put a pico cell, they have to redo all the planning exercise. Okay? So they have to do that very carefully. And that is administered by the, by the operator. Then I have the femto cell. Femto cell is about you. Okay? Femto cell is a consumer product. Okay, it's, uh, it's like a Wi-Fi station. You, you decide when to buy it, you decide where to put it, and you pay the electricity bill. Okay? That was actually one of the reasons why the operators have uh, agreed to the whole uh, issue of, the, uh, of, of rolling out uh, some equipment which doesn't belong to them, because they figured out that you know, installing, meeting the capacity, you need to install many, many small base stations, okay, like Pico cells, but it's expensive, it doesn't scale. Because you need to buy the bus, you need to maintain them, you need to pay the electricity for the whole thing. Okay? Now, if they could outsource it, and that's precisely what they did, they outsourced it to the consumer and they say, okay, if you put it at home, you have a fantastic cellular coverage for voice, for whatever video you want. Uh, the only thing is you need to pay the electricity bill. Of course, they don't tell you that, but so you know. So here you go. If you look at the, uh, um, the differences between uh, these three, the Wi Fi, PicoCell, and FemtoCell, just from a visual point of view, there's no difference. All right? They're all the same. In fact, the RF technology, the radio chips, etc., the FPGAs and the DSPs and whatever, they are very similar. We're converging. Size, cost, capability. It's, uh, it's very, very similar technology. The only difference is that the Pico cell is administered by the operator, so the AT&T guys would need to decide where to put it. You have to redo all the planning. And in case of the Wi-Fi and Fender cell, you decide essentially where to put it and what to do. But there's one very important difference between Wi-Fi and Fender. Very important. Um, it's the interference management. Okay? I'm not sure how it is here in the US, but in Europe, when I'm at home, I see like 20 <coughs> Wi-Fi stations. Okay? So I cannot work between my living room and my working room. I cannot. Because interference is just too heavy. You know, plus uh, plays a game. Everybody's watching it, and uh, everybody's happy, and chatting, etc., etc. So it turns out that you know I cannot have a decent Wi-Fi connection over three meters of distance because of interference. Now, in the case of the Fento cells, it turns out because there is some really controlled technology in here with some very established uh, rules because you're using license spectrum, you're using the very same spectrum as your normal cellular interface, okay? They have to have interference management capabilities built in. And that becomes very beautiful the moment you start ramping up the density of fentanyl cells. And the problem you, you, you observe here will not be observed here, at least not to that degree of gravity. Now, this is what the operators blame. Okay? for a long time. It's a very established technology. Okay, I love Wi-Fi, no problem. But this is good in terms of interference, interference control, throughput, etc. Now what are the opportunities? So a lot of stuff you can do once you put a, a an LTE or whatever, 4G or 5G fantasy cell into your home. Um, in addition or as a replacement of Wi-Fi, you essentially enable the whole 
ecosystem of, of, of intelligent homes, okay, multimedia, streaming, sensor networks, you know, stuff which is controlling your plans, a lot of stuff you can bring up. Another thing which is important is the customer churn. So churn is something the operators are afraid of. It refers to the process of people leaving the operator because they're not happy. Okay? If you're an AT&T customer, you have a lot of drop calls. You may want to change. That is called churn. And the operators would like to minimize that. Okay? Now, it uh, turns out that Femtos can really reduce that customer churn simply if they give you a better experience. So once you, once you start going to, into the basement, you are deep into your apartment, you start having you know, voice quality problems with your macro cell, where you typically associate with a femto cell, you don't have it at all. Okay? You just have good voice quality, everything's good. You can have offload traffic, energy savings, there's a lot of other stuff you can do, but I don't want to go into that. Um, just in terms of appeal, people find it appealing. You know, even though I'm sure probably in this room, not even five people have heard of a femto cell until my presentation today, but it turns out in the United States, 38% 30, 30 would love to have a femto cell at home. Maybe I can convince you now, uh, and you go and buy them, actually you can buy them. So it's, um, it's a surprisingly high, high number of things. The ecosystem is formed, so we're not talking about a revolutionary new technology. Okay, we have uh, companies out there, very big companies. You know, companies, all of them have a CEO, CFO, have done the calculus, is that worth doing? Is that a product worth developing? And they decided, yes it is. So they built this entire ecosystem of um, you know, providers, components, access points, core network, end-to-end -end solutions, and so forth. So you see probably about 40, 30% uh, of the companies uh, are actually from the United States. In terms of rollouts, it's happening as we speak. So Verizon is rolling out um, all over the world. Let me just show you maybe the, the business model, and that's quite interesting. So today you can buy them. Okay, probably you didn't know that, but you could do it. So you can go to a shop or Sprint or to Verizon, AT&T, say, hey, I want to have a femto cell just to, you know, to have a better voice quality and data quality when I use your cellular interface. So you go to them and AT&T says, okay, pay me $160, one off, the box is yours. All right? Um, that's one model. Then there's Sprint, which says, okay, you got the box for free, but you have to pay me $5 uh, in addition to the ones you pay me already. So that's a deal as well. You know, you may choose whether you want to have a capital expenditure model pay at the beginning, you don't pay anything later, or you want to just have you know, the ability to choose when to let go. But uh, so all over the world, it's more or less the same, except in Japan. Now there's a company called SoftBank, which I think incidentally wants to buy Verizon, I believe, I'm not quite sure. So there's a company in, 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 in Japan called SoftBank. What they did is they offered it completely for free. Okay, no CapEx, no offers. <coughs> you don't pay anything uh, ramp up, you don't pay any subscription fee. Just get the box for free. Um, now, how they, they gonna, how they do many, I don't know, you've got to figure that out. Well, that's an interesting business model. Apparently, it would do well if they want to buy uh, rise on one of the American carriers. There you go. So, Femicell now is, uh, is predicted to grow, given the potential, essentially. It's a bit of a low, slow start yet, but people get to know about it. So, that is going to take off. We'll see whether the predictions hold true in a few years' time. I kind of went up to the technical issues. Okay, in the end, we're engineers. So I want to introduce a little bit to the technical uh, issues in the whole design. First of all, you know, when you come to this, these type of ecosystems, you typically have uh, uh, an alliance and or a standard behind it. Okay? An alliance and a standard are two very different things. So don't confuse that. A standard is really something which is uh, standardizing a technology worldwide to be used uh, so a different manufacturer can reproduce that component it would work together with other manufacturers component that's a that's a standard now in alliance is if a few companies get together and start pushing for a certain type of technology and often out of an alliance comes a standard or out of the standard comes an alliance so it's a very complex ecosystem between um, you know, power, money, uh, technology, plans, etc. Et so in this case, we had an alliance which was called Fonto Fento Forum. So they were pushing for uh, developing these small boxes you install at home instead of, you know, uh, Wi-Fi. They are renamed now to the small, small, the small Cell Forum this year, simply because, you know, they wanted to address other markets as well. And then come the, <coughs> the standards bodies. So there's 3GPP. 3GPP are the guys who standardize the cellular systems. Okay, it came out of... Uh, a worldwide association of 3G, if you have a 3G interface, has been standardized by 3GBP. When you were using now the 3.9G, the uh, what Verizon office and AT&T has been standardized by, standardized by these guys. So they're very active. 
And it turns out they have been actually kind of uh, blocking a little bit the femtocell rollout because operators in reality at the early days didn't like femtocells. Okay? They didn't like it at all because they were using the very same spectrum for which they have paid a lot of money and uh, they had no control over them. Okay? Because it is you as a customer who decides where to put the femtocell. They don't like that because uh, it means screwing up coverage and interference maps and having a little control over that. So there was a lot of wrangling and it took a long time until the term HENB appeared in the standard. Now, ENB stands for E node B, which is a base station, okay, and the H stands for home. So this is a femtocell. So it's just a few years back that we have the term H E node B in the BGPP standard. <laughs> And it was because manufacturers have been pushing a lot to, 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 to do that. We have IEEE working on that, and uh, GSMA and other standards bodies who work on femtocells. Let's come to the technical issues. Now, these are essentially uh, the challenges you have to address to make these systems happen. And today we're going to talk only about one very briefly, which is in this uh, interference measure. But I want you to understand that you really need to work on the low device cost, because that is a consumer product. This is not anymore a, a, a base station which an operator puts up. A base station costs a lot of money, okay, hundred thousand dollars, whatever. You can't buy that. We're talking about an equipment which shouldn't cost more than 100, 150 hundred dollars. So cost has to go down. And uh, it turns out that to do that for four G, five G is very challenging because the RF is very complicated. You need the high precision of the clocks. It's very expensive material. So people are pretty much crazy now to build these really cheap uh, base stations which will be 4G, 5G enabled. So that's one of the things. Another one is interference. We'll talk about this. Um, I'll explain this later, so I'll not uh, dwell on that. Once you solve the interference problem, you clearly want to maximize capacity. This is when the radio resource management comes in, the control of who transmits when without interfering. Because it turns out that Wi-Fi, when there are loads of Wi-Fi base stations around, the only problem is, is to handle the contention. You spend a lot of time saying, hey, I want to talk, hey, I want to talk, I want to talk. So it's a very inefficient, because it's not quite an inefficient uh, contention protocol. And, uh, you know, if they could solve that, you could have no problem. 16, 20 Wi-Fi stations operating, maybe in a time, time division fashion to get all the data for So we have maximized capacity. And then you have another problem, which is the backhaul. Because you have to offload the traffic. Okay, so I'm generating a lot of traffic between my mobile phone or my computer and the femtocell, and then what? Then you have to offload the whole thing. So if it's one house, it's okay. But if you have a you know a building of hundred thousand households and everybody is offloading uh, a lot of traffic, suddenly the backhaul becomes a major issue. So therefore, people started designing different backhaul solutions. And then you, of course you have to make build a viable system architecture which allows the access backhaul and all these technologies to work together. So let's dwell a little bit on the interference management. And just for you to understand what type of interference could occur, there are four different cases. In fact, the, the major headache today is the interference between a femtocell user and a microcell user. So, okay, so what may happen is that we have a femtocell installed right here. It's using the very same spectrum as my microcell system. We have a user here who uses a femtocell uh, terminal or talking, downloading video, etc. And we have another user in here who uses a macrocell uh, uh, connection. Okay? Simply because, for whatever reason, might be a, the majors don't have the rights to access that femtocell. Okay? Now, what can happen is this base station is transmitting at a fairly low power, but just sufficient power so it reaches the femtocell user. But at the same time, because it's wireless, it's broadcast. It is interfering with the microcell user who tries to get the signal from, from his or her microcell uh, base station. So interference occurs. So the person who's in the microcell network is so-called trapped. It's a trapped user. It's trapped in my interference trap of the femtocell. And that user will not be happy because he cannot browse data, he cannot make a phone call. There uh, will be a lot of dropping. They don't like that. You get unhappy, uh, you go to another operator. Customer chain. So therefore, we have to solve that problem. That's actually the biggest interference problem we have. There are other problems, other interference problems, but that's a specific problem. I want to show you how we went to that. Now, how is it done in interference coordination in standards bodies today? 
So the 3GPP, the cellular community, you know, as they keep on standardizing new systems, 2G, 3G, etc., they, they, they fire out so-called releases, okay? And they release, two releases, three releases together may form a specific system, okay? So um, UMTS has been a set of releases, 4G has been a set of releases. So since release 10, I'm not sure I have it in here, yes, release 10, so the R10 up there, we have a concept called the intercell interference coordination. What do you do? Are you trying to coordinate interference between different cells? Because my femto is creating a cell and the macro is creating the cell. And they're overlapping in the same frequency. Um, if you use it at the same time, you have a, you have a call at the same time, same frequency, you have an interference problem. So they said, okay, when we start coordinating this, the ICIC, we can coordinate it in frequency um, in so-called carriers. So you could say, let's say the microcell is using, you know, this blue kind of carrier, two of them. The femtocell could use both carriers at the same time, but the microcell user in this carrier says, hey, I'm trapped, okay, I have a problem here. I cannot communicate, there's somebody interfering with me. So the microcell informs the femtocell saying, hey, don't use that carrier because you're trapping one of my users. Uh, you can use the other one, but don't use this one. Okay, so they're coordinating the use of the frequency um, at that specific point. You can do that at the same in the time domain. You can say, okay, at this moment, both of them can use the whole frequency, at this moment they cannot. So this is what is happening. Now, if you look at how the, uh, the, uh, the packets are built today, the packets which are actually flowing in time and frequency in the systems, uh, you, have, you get a graph like this. So this is an OFDM symbol. I'm not sure you're familiar with this type of uh, modulation scheme. So what is happening? is you have your data, that's a time domain, and you have a frequency domain there. So you have uh, typically, you know, one to three symbols, which are all here, symbols which is control data, which are the dark ones, and you have the light ones, which is my data, my actual data you're transmitting. You always need control data, always, because the control data tells essentially the transmitter and the receiver what's the modulation scheme, what's the data in there, how long is my packet, etc. So there's a lot of stuff information in there. And it turns out that uh, everybody actually in, in my community worked on interference avoidance schemes for the data region, but very little on the control region. It turns out that of course if you interfere on the control packets, the problem is that you're not even to you're not even able to decode the data packets. It doesn't make sense, okay? So it doesn't make sense to protect your data if you haven't protected your control. So therefore, we started working a lot on protecting the control uh, the control part, and that's the only, the only type of research I'll show you, partly on the management side. So what, do we, what did we do? We figured out how is the control information packaged today, okay? So you have the sub and frequency, and these are the three symbols in time here. Um, a control channel always contains three fields, always, okay, for all systems. One is the actual control frame indicator that tells you how is my con control channel actually packaged, what is in there, where are the different control information. Second one is the con downlink control uh, data, so it means the cell identifier, what is the ID of the base station, who are my neighbors, uh, handover procedures, stuff like this. And the third one is the um, hybrid AIQ indicator that means an indication on how my uplink traffic went, you know, it means if you communicate with me, and it turns out I did not receive your packet, I tell you in this control packet that, hey, please resend it again because I didn't receive it, okay? So these are the three uh, parts we always have and we need to protect them. Now it turns out if you look on how this is done today, if I just look very quickly on the coexistence between a macro cell and a femto cell, and the macro cell is three of the symbols has control data, and the femtocell in three symbols has control data. What you want to do is, is to ensure that this control data does not collide with this control data. Okay? Now, it also turns out that the position of the control information is deterministically linked to a specific number each cell gets, okay? which is called the PCI, the physical cell identifier. There are not so many of them, okay? but if you have a PCI of one, you put it somewhere in control data. If you have a PCI 10, you put it somewhere else, okay? So right now how it is done is the PCIs are actually planned for the macro cells, but the femtocells choose them randomly. So it can happen that a femtocell is being switched on, chooses a PCI which happens to put the control information such that they collide with the macro cells, so you lose all your packets. 
Okay. So the exercise now is very simple. What we do is we switch on the femto. The femto listens. Hey, is there a macro cell around? What's a PCI? Okay, I'm going to choose a PCI which is different from the macro cell PCI such that uh, I can place my symbols, my control data, in a non-interfering manner to my macro cell data. Okay? This is essentially what's being done. It works really well. It's backwards compatible um, and it really manages the interference between the phantom and the macro cell very well. Um, we worked a lot on this interference management stuff. And uh, once you manage the interference between macro and femtos, you have a different type of interference. The interference between femtos and femtos. Imagine your campus here. Most likely, you wouldn't put out a single femto cell. You would put out like 20 hundred, uh, you know, uh, 500 femto cells. And suddenly, you see actually the main interference comes from the uh, femto cells between each other, like we have at the Wi-Fi station. Uh, so we worked a lot on how to do that, but I'm not going to present that. So if somebody is interested, you should contact. Now comes the um, an interesting part, actually, a really uh, forward-looking part here, because as we start growing networks. Uh, it becomes more and more complicated to manage them. Okay, so the management problem is a big problem. You have that, you know, as you grow, you know, your, your team, your research team as it gets bigger and bigger. The problem is not the individual anymore, but to manage the whole team together. The same happens right here in front of our house as with the cellular systems. Simply because we have a lot of different standards in here. We have loads of Wi-Fi's, loads of Fetus cells, loads of micro cells, Pico cells, machine-to-machine, um, -machine, uh, etc. You name it. It's a lot of stuff suddenly coming out. Some of them coexisting, some of them competing. Now, how do you manage that in real time? Get the maximum out of that. It's pretty pretty difficult to do. And the only way of doing that is to um, is to look into something which is uh, called self-organizing networking. So it's a big thing taken off in the standards community today. So people work on this. And self-organizing means, you know, you let machines do what humans can do. Okay? Now, machines are very bad in, you know, writing uh, poems and uh, composing things, but they're very good in two things. First thing is they're very good in uh, doing boring jobs. Okay, jobs which are very repetitive, very stupid jobs are pretty good at that. And they're very good in doing things which we cannot do quickly enough. Okay, so it can be very reactive, can do very, very well. So the boring job is, for example, if you put up a base station, it turns out, and very few people know that, that a whole team, a whole crew of engineers has to go there, not only mount it physically, but you actually have to do a lot of software programming. Okay, you need to check the inventory, what's the software, you have to update it, get the IPv6, the IP address, you have to establish a tunnel to the operator's backhoe, etc. So a lot of manual job, and often you're out there, you know, minus 10 degrees, and uh, it's very cold, and so it's a, it's a very operational problem. So if you can let the, uh, a machine do that automatically, that would be great. And this is essentially what the first self-organizing networking mechanisms, HTTP, were doing. And another one, which of course the machines are pretty good, is, is to balance uh, very quickly, you know, capacity, resources, to say, okay, this base station transmits at that power, this one at that power. So you're balancing things very quickly, and this is what machines are doing today. Okay, now we have essentially, we can use song, the self organizer in the, the planning process, in the self configuration, which I just explained, and the self optimization, self healing as well. Imagine there's one sector which is going an outage because. Uh, whatever, the, the actual antenna rate broke down. You know, then normally the sector is out, you get a uh, drop call, but it would be great if you have the adjacent cells understanding, hey, this part is not covered, now what can I do? So the adjacent cells automatically ramp up their tilt, okay, you'll see actually, if you, if you look exactly, typically antennas are slightly tilted, okay, about uh, two, two, three, five degrees. Uh, today it's an electrical tilt, so you can actually change that, okay, so you change it back, you have automatically a larger coverage here, and uh, all the adjacent uh, sectors suddenly start, uh, uh, you know, helping that sector which is going in outage. That's called cell healing. So a lot of stuff which is still open yet. Now, what you're trading? Uh, you're trading essentially different self-organizing mechanisms here. You can do everything in a centralized fashion. Okay. What does it mean centralized? You collect all the data from all the cells in San Antonio and uh, you let some very powerful algorithms run on top, trying to find an optimum transmission power policy, admission control, saying you know, 20 people here are not admitted, 50 are admitted, which power do you get, which resources, when do you transmit, what do you transmit. So you do that all centrally. The only problem is, of course, that it's an information overflow. It's too much information. You're uploading that to the central service. 
it takes a lot of time, a lot of overhead, then you have to get it down again. So it takes time. On the other hand, you have the localized one. Okay, so localized means the AFM to sell takes the decision on its own, and in between you have the distributors and neighbors and whatnot. So how it's been used today. So the localized self-organizing are typically schedulers, so like power allocation, resource allocation, you do that in a single fan to sell, it doesn't talk to the neighboring one. Everything which comes to handover procedures, so as you walk through the campus, you need to be handover from one cell to another. And uh, typically that is done in a, in a, in a self-organizing fashion. You need a lot of load balancing here, so if it turns out that you know one part of the cafeteria is using a lot of capacity and another one not so much, how can you balance a load between that? So this is a neighboring issue, so that's done in a distributed fashion. And the centralized one is you know you get a lot of information from the cell identified, uh, cell identifiers, etc. etc. So I want to introduce you to one specific um, self-organizing methods we have worked on. Okay, so I'm not sure you're familiar with the with the cognitive framework. So maybe, you know, as undergrads, I'm not sure what the composition of this room is. But the, it's a very hot term in the, uh, has been at least a very hot term in our community, cognitive networks. Co cognitive cognizer comes from Latin, means to learn. Okay, so these networks learn the behavior. They observe things, okay, so you observe things, uh, acquisition, you see what's happening, you get a lot of data, you get interference, etc., etc. You learn on the run, you take an intelligent decision, and you execute it. Okay, and that's that. and again you observe them. it's called the cognitive cycle. Okay, it's been used now a little bit more and more in the wireless systems today. And clearly that is a facilitator for self-organizing networking because these networks learn, conditions change, so they change the operational mode, etc. It turns out that doing these cognitive systems, they are not very stable. There's a lot of instability here, okay? And typically, performance graphs I've shown, they look all very nice and flat, but actually the average is, so there's a lot of oscillation happening, uh, and the systems are very far from optimal. So what we introduced, actually, what I introduced is a called uh, docetive radio. It comes from docere Latin to teach. So imitating, essentially, the student-pupil relationship we have replicated so well in, the, in our society, where, you know, you're not learning from scratch, you're actually going to school, you're learning from a teacher, uh, you become teachers, uh, you know, the people who talk become teachers, so you're actually passing on that knowledge. So we have done that for the cognitive radius, and we said, hey, why should every single base station, every single terminal, every single femur cell learn from zero? It takes a lot of time. Uh, just choose a good teacher around, another factor cell, which is a good teacher, learn from them, and pass on that information. So this is how the decision is being done, and it turns out it is just behaving really well. I'll show this later some, some graphs. Now the specific learning algorithm we use is a so-called Q-learning algorithm. It comes from the machine learning community, it's a reinforcement learning algorithm. It's very simple, it actually operates exactly the same way as the humans operate. Okay? It has an input, which is here, and it has an output, which is there. Okay? And you relate in a table the input with the output. I always give the example like a small kid learning to cross essentially a street with traffic light. Okay? So the two inputs are essentially the traffic light is green, the traffic light is red, and the output is uh, you can walk, you don't walk. Okay? So at the beginning the kid would know, you know, no matter what the color is, no matter whether it's green or red, it cross the street. So the mum would say, you know, when the traffic light is green, would say, well done, and when the traffic light is red, you know, you get one on your, on your back. So, and you do that, you essentially register that for yourself. You're building these reward coefficients, okay, which link the input with the output, and you realize when it's green, it's good, reward goes up. Uh, if it's uh, walking and red, uh, it's bad, so punishment goes up. And this is how you build the section of the table, and you populate it. It takes time to learn, okay? Now that's a simple one, two by two. In reality, we have a lot of interference levels, a lot of uh, possibilities to transmit. So these tables grow very quickly, and to learn this takes time and it's not very steady. So therefore, the position, okay? It's not only about learning, it's also about teaching. So instead of a femtocell cell with an enormous table trying to learn again and again the very same thing which the neighbor has learned, hey, exchange intelligence. Intelligence means you exchange neurons, literally. The neurons in this case are the entries of the table. So we distinguish them so-called startup position and IQ-driven decision. That means startup means a femtocell uh, ramps up, tries to figure out who's the most intelligent neighbor, 
takes essentially the brain from the neighbor, imports it into, into its own operations and gets going. And the IQ driven means we are constantly monitoring who is the intelligent guy in the room. Okay? Because they're exploring and exploiting in a different way. It turns out that some FM2 cells turn out to be more intelligent than others. So we started building uh, intelligence gradients and teaching along the gradients. And I hope it's fun stuff we did then. And that's the IQ driven decision. Now, when it comes to performance, then uh, this is what we observe. So what, what I plotted here specifically is a microcell capacity versus the number of femtocells which are active. Okay? Microcell means really the microcell users versus the femtocell you at home. Now what of course a, a, a microcell operator would like to see is as you increase the number of femtocells, you know, the capacity of the microcell system should not suffer at all because they don't want customers to be unhappy, right? They don't want the customer churn. So capacity shouldn't decrease. It turns out if you use the, the traditional opportunistic type of algorithms, the capacity, which is that line here, capacity decreases very quickly as you start switching on more and more femtocells. Contrary, all our um, intelligent self-organizing stuff, you know, being the cognitive and the two dosative ones here, which are out there, they barely register actually a breakdown in capacity because they are adapting. As you start switching on more and more femtos, yes, interference increases, so the contention for the channel increases, but it's adapting all the time, learning all the time, and you see that the performance is pretty good. Now, all three of them are very close, but if you start looking at another uh, performance graph here, which is essentially the variance, the error you get when you run the different algorithms, you see that my cognitive algorithm has an error which is pretty large, and the dosative ones, which we introduced, the teaching one, is pretty low. Okay? So what does it say? You know, it means essentially, you know, you have for this one, you have a variance which is very high. It's oscillating quite a lot. Sometimes you're in good position, but sometimes in a bad one. And in this case here, uh, you have very small oscillation and it's a pretty stable solution. Okay, so coming now to the um, to the end really. Uh, future challenges um, for the Femto one, I think the biggest challenge is to accommodate for the heterogeneous uh, assembly of technologies because you know, there will be Femto cells at home, there will be Wi-Fi stations at home, there will be machine-to-machine -machine solutions at home. I'm about today, actually at 6 o'clock today I'll be talking about machines. There's a lot of technology coming out here uh, which you really need, need to make sure you know this has to coexist and have very different requirements. So. Therefore, the self-organizing stuff will be uh, core to all those developments. There's very little spoken. That's a very exciting research area to work on. You know, whether it's for the master's master projects of the year, for the PhD projects, etc. 3GPP, the, stand, the, the leading standards body on cellular designs, uh, they need input on some. It's uh, loads of open actions here. And then the business model, I think it's quite interesting. Um, you know, what's a business model ready to run these kind of cells? Um, there's a, um, I'm not sure, do you know a company called Fon? It's a company founded by an Argentinian guy who lives in Madrid in Spain, and it's for Wi-Fi, okay? So the idea is you buy a little dongle, uh, you attach it to your Wi-Fi station, and it allows essentially other phone users to use your Wi-Fi okay? Without you needing to give away your password, or to be afraid that they would actually take a lot of capacity, so throttling the, the, the bandwidth. Maybe the same has to be used really for femtocells to get that um, that working. So future rollout, the last slide really, sorry, future rollouts. We talked a lot today about the standalone femtocells. That means you know you go home, you put your femtocell like a Wi-Fi station, uh, your neighbor does the same, etc. But as a, but as the capacity increases, the number of femtocells increases. We will observe something like a network femtocell. Same will happen maybe on the campus. As you start rolling out more and more family cells, uh, they start being network. And then something interesting is happening, a little unexpected actually, uh, manufacturers and operators start looking into the outdoor piece. Okay? Femto before was really indoor. But suddenly it turns out, hey, why can't we use a femto solar cell outdoors if there's a, pro a problem with capacity in the sports event? A lot of people there trying to you know, make phone calls, etc., etc. So you, you essentially, it's not the operator who puts up the capacity, it's the actual facility provider, the guys who own the stadium of this university. They may put out some temper cells and say, just, you know, I'll give you better quality, voice quality, video quality, when you come to my facility. 
And the uh, final one is the mobile femto. And here the beauty is you put a femto cell in the bus, in the train, in an airplane. And instead of being 20 or 50 people associated with a macro cell, you would just connect all to the femto cell. And uh, the nice thing is, is on the handover procedures, because traditionally you're like 50 people in the, in the bus, and you drive through essentially a, a micro cell, go to another micro cell, you have to hand over all 50 people, it's a lot of signaling. Now if you just uh, hand over a single phantom cell, you get actually a lot of gains okay, in terms of uh, handover traffic. And actually, the only reason you're not allowed to use a mobile phone in the airplane is this. Okay, there's no other reason, you can do it, there's no problem. Okay, if that was really a safety issue, they would take it away. But the actual reason why you're not allowed to use it, because 300 people on the Boeing 747, sitting there, the Boeing 707 taken off, and suddenly, you know, the whole cellular system breaks down because it has to hand over a lot of people from one, one cell to the other, okay? So next time, if you have a bit of uh, guts, you know, leave your mobile phone on and make a phone call when you're landing. <laughs> There's no problem, you can do it, okay? No problem, we designed the system to be like this. But so, just so you know. All right, that's really it, thank you very much.